Afternoon, everybody. Yeah, yeah afternoon. Hi. Great. Yeah. Do you want to go ahead and jump into the kind of orienting folks to the system, James, and then we'll, yeah. we'll kind of roll into the meeting? I'll make sure the reshare the slide. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, just as a quick recap, uh, thank you all for joining us, first of all, of course. Um, just a re quick recap of the controls for many of you, I'm sure you're quite familiar with this by now. Uh, but just in case, maybe it's your first time. Um, so here's the controls for your, if you see the little red microphone with a line through it, that means that you are muted and we can't hear you. If you have done a mic check with me, that means that we have unmuted you on our end. It, when you come into the webinar by default, you are muted on the organizer level. Um, so if you have done a mic check, then you should have the ability to unmute, in which case when you click the red one, it becomes green and then we can hear you. Um, if any presenters haven't done the mic check yet, I'm not sure, uh, then let me know, raise your hand, or you put in the chat, um, and when it's your time to present, then we can unmute you on our end for you to unmute yourself. And then for the hand raise function, um, so that if it's a little green with a, with a little green arrow, you can put your hand up, that means your hand is currently down, otherwise you can put it down if your hand is already raised. Um, sometimes people leave them up, in which case I'll just ask you, Hey, is your hand still up for a reason? And then we can also put it down on our end if that happens. Um, that's pretty much the basics of the controls. Please stay muted if you are, unless you are presenting or asking a question. Um, and we'll have time for questions during the presentations. We have the discussion at the end. So we'll have set times to talk. So please like wait until the, the appropriate moment to make your comments. Um, the other thing I want to remind people of, we are going to encourage the presenters. You don't have to, but if you would like to share your video while you're presenting, I think it gives a little more of a better, uh, a closer feel for the people watching. And for those of you that sent me your slides, I do have them on backup, but I can make you, I will make everybody a presenter when it's your turn to present so that you can show your own slides as you like. And then if there's an issue, I can always pivot to sharing your slides for you. So with that, I'll pass it off to Jonathan to get us started. Yeah, thanks. And, and I guess for the presenters as well, um, once, you, once you are allowed, a, presenter capacity, the, a little video option will pop up next to the, the mute function there. So um, if you don't see it now, don't panic. Um, and yeah, and the other thing I guess we should note is that the, the meeting is being recorded. Um, we will be posting the recording of the meeting up to uh, the River Herring Forum webpage um, at, at the, you know, following the end of this meeting, and it will stay up there for the rest of this calendar year, um, along with the agenda, um, just for everyone's reference. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, that's, that's, I think, covers us for housekeeping stuff. I, I appreciate everybody coming in this Monday afternoon. Um, I'm Jonathan Watson with NOAA Fisheries uh, in the Habitat and Ecosystem Services Division down in the Annapolis Field Office uh, in Maryland. And James, do you want to introduce yourself real quick before we go through the, um, the agenda? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm James Boyle. For those of you who don't know, I'm the Fishery Management Plan Coordinator for Shadden River Herring at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Great. Um, yeah, so as you can see, we you know got the agenda together. Thanks, um, you know, for everybody for their their feedback, uh, suggestions, um, and participation in this. Um, we're gonna obviously start off with you know the housekeeping stuff that we've basically run through now, um, then move into some management updates from the commission as well as the, the two councils, um, and then we're gonna dive right into our uh, two um, technical presentations for today. Uh, the first from uh, Dan Stitch at SUNY Oneana, um, looking at you know blueback herring, um, fish passage standards and mortality in the Hudson and Mohawk rivers. Um, I think that work is somewhat affiliated with the uh, forthcoming um, benchmark stock assessment that ASNSC is is working through at the moment, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then after that, we have uh, Carrie Reed uh, joining us all the way from um, University of Hong Kong. Thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, for calling in at, at 1 a.m. Uh, local time for you to um, you know present to us today, um, and Carrie will be um, giving a presentation uh, about a, a a paper that was published uh, the fall of uh, 2022, um, basically refining um, some of the the work uh, you know published uh, by by uh, Eric Palkabax and others um, several years ago. Um, I thought that would be of interest and, and reached out to, to her to uh, present to us today. So again, thank you so much for both of, to, to both of our technical pre presenters here. Really appreciate your participation. Um, after that, we'll dive into a couple of uh, noted uh, general updates. Uh, I'll be talking first about the River Herring Habitat Conservation Plan, which I presented on at the fall meeting of the River Herring Forum last, last fall. 
Um, then we'll move into uh, an update from Jim Turek at NOAA's Restoration Center, talk about some um, recent funding opportunities that are coming up. Um, after that, we'll have Brian Wade Germandry from um, NIFWIF give a presentation about funding opportunities that, that they may have coming up here um, in the near future. Um, and then we'll move into an update from Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries and, and Manama about their um, river herring network that's going on up there in, in uh, northern New England. And then finally, uh, round that all out with an update from the USGS on the genetic repository work. Um, so appreciate everybody who's given updates today. Um, and then at the end here, you know, we, we always set aside time at the end for open discussion and, and general updates. The, you know, the forum is supposed to be a, a collaborative and interactive um, atmosphere uh, to, you know, to benefit the species by coordinating, you know, across our various watersheds and, and regions. Um, so encourage folks that are, um, you know, sitting here in the meeting today to, to give a little bit of thought about you know, any updates you may want to share during that period or questions you want to ask, discussion items that have been on your mind lately. Um, you know, we'd, we'd like to have that 40 minutes be a, a lively discussion um, at the end and, and encourage your full participation. So this is my plug to kind of get the wheels turning for folks to, to think about something you'd like to share at that time. Um, and after that, we'll wrap and adjourn. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it back over to James to, uh, to kick off our, our management update section. Go ahead, James, thanks. Thanks, Don. Okay, so before I pass it off to Katie Drew for our biggest topic is obviously the ongoing river herring benchmark stock assessment. I just have a quick recap since of the policy and management side. So since our last meeting in October, we've had two Shen River Herring board meetings um, where a few river herring topics came up if people were interested. So first, Massachusetts updated their uh, sustainable fishery management plan that can be found on our website. They updated the section for the Namaskit River and they added a new section for the Herring River. In addition, uh, the main, the addendum to the main sustainable fishery management plan was reviewed where in 2020 they were approved for a, a provisional fishery for a few different ponds. Um, that was, had a, it was set through 2024 with a, a planned review in 2022. So we had that planned review and the board approved that fishery to continue for the remainder of the experimental time period of 2024. Um, and then at this most recent board meeting in February, there was, uh, we approved, the, the board approved the fishery management plan review uh, and state compliance for the 2021 fishing year. So that can also be found on our website to review the Shad and River Herring fisheries of the last, of 2021. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Katie Drew for an update on the assessment. Great, thanks, James. Um, so the River Herring Stock Assessment Subcommittee met uh, in mid-February to have a methods workshop uh, virtually, um, where basically we reviewed sort of the data and the data processing and analyses that had been completed up until that point, and then discussed kind of what we would like to do with all of that data moving forward. Um, and so, you know, we've got a good set of analyses that we're starting to work on right now um, to to push this assessment further forward. Um, I think the major um, sort of update for you all is that the timeline has been pushed back a few months. So I think, you know, when we met in uh, February, we decided we needed a few extra months to really finalize a lot of these um, analyses in order to have the best possible um, stock assessment. So originally our schedule was to have the assessment peer reviewed um, in August and presented to the board in November. Um, but right now we are looking at pushing that back one meeting cycle. So the current plan is to have the um, assessment workshop in August um, and then have this peer reviewed uh, in late November, early December, so that we can present it to the board at their February meeting instead. Um, so not a big timeline shift, but we're hoping those extra few months will really let us um, wrap some of this stuff up in a very satisfying, as satisfying a way as possible. Um, so that's kind of our, our big update out of that. Um, and we're continuing to have um, SAS calls uh, throughout uh, this process up until the um, assessment workshop in August. So happy to take any questions. Um, otherwise, back to you, James. Thanks, Katie. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, that wraps it up for the commission. And we can pass it off to Jason Didden for a Mid-Atlantic Council update.
Yes, Holly, uh, you are now unmuted on our end, so you can unmute. Hi, um, Katie, thank you for the update. And you may have said this, and I'm so sorry if I missed it, but are we going to try to incorporate 2022 data? And if so, um, when should uh, states kind of get those last pieces of 2022 data to the SAS? So excellent question. Um, we'll be reaching out to the, the states sort of individually based on what we think we will be able to update based. So everybody, originally gave us sort of a timeline of this is when we think various things are going to be available. Um, and so depending on um, if it is available, we'll be reaching out and, and asking for you guys to provide that data shortly um, based on kind of a combination of whether we're going to use it or not. Um, and when you said that uh, you could have it ready. So we'll um, expect contact from us on that front shortly. Cool. Thank you very much. And if there are no other questions, then uh, Jason, you can feel free to take it away. I'm not sure if we've done a mic check. If not, then raise your hand and I can unmute you on our end. Yeah, I think I'm good. Um, can I share my screen? Yep, let me uh, make you a presenter for one sec. Yep, should be good to go now. Okay, you see this, uh, you see a quota graph currently? Yes, yes. Okay, um, okay, so quick, um, a few couple of things. So this is the Atlantic uh, mackerel quota monitoring site at Garfo. Um, mackerel is a fishery that has been of most concern. I mean, longfin squid catches some river herring also, but mackerel has been of most concern. Um, so you can see they caught about, and mackerel is in a rebuilding plan, um, currently, but the, you can see this year with in the current rebuilding, they're a little under a quarter of the quota. Um, and then looking at the river herring and shad cap in the macro fishery, they're at about two thirds of that cap. Um, so that tells me that you know there probably were a couple um, some trips early in the year um, that had pretty high bycatch ratio of river herring and shad. Again, low mackerel catch, high cap utilization. Um, there must have been some high observed bycatch um, early in the year. So um, there were some herring closures earlier. So then that kind of shut things down. Herring just reopened, Atlantic herring just reopened last week. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if some more mackerel landings come in with that and or um, if, um, if mackerel gets shut down because of its river herring and shad cap um, fairly quickly, depending on the scale of those landings. And of course, any other um, observed trips that come in along, um, along with that. And uh, I think one of the herring areas might be in a similar kind of situation, but Jamie can touch on that. Um, so let's see, how do I stop sharing here? See a pause? In the sharing tab. Sharing tab. There's a stack from stack from screen. Sharing tab. Um, I'm not seeing it, but maybe can you just have me stop sharing or just demake me a presenter? Uh, maybe that's it. I'm not sure. Um, that's it. Anyway, uh, um, so a um, couple other updates. So I'll be doing. Um, the council every other year has been doing like a river herring and shad update where I ask uh, the center to update their um, bycatch analyses across the gear types for the four different river herring and shad species. I think um, still planning on doing that. I also um, kind of scrabbled together a few of the, um, the indices, um, the center's indices, NEMAP, a few of the state's indices. Um, so, I mean, it's, I think people have liked it in the past, especially on off years from assessments, um, may not be as quite as useful this year with the assessment, um, rolling, but anyway, we'll, we'll do that again this year. Um, and I think that's it. The council, um, 
I think it's uh, funding. It's been kind of a long sought after project of mine to create like a um, a, a portal that um, can be kind of used coast wide for people to report runs into um, and with um, with Manimate. But I think they'll talk about they'll probably touch on that later. So um, I'll just leave that out as a teaser for later. And I think that's um, it for me. Thanks, Jason. Um, if uh, it will be sure to share the links um, to the report you pulled up at the beginning of your update um, in the re meeting recap the email that we send out after this meeting. So if folks um, wanted to take a deeper look there, we'll do that. Um, but if any, does anyone have any uh, questions for Jason, feel free to raise your hand or we can also keep an eye on the uh, questions box as well. Not seeing anything, so we can um, we can switch over to um, Jamie Kernan from the Northeastern Council. Yeah, thank you. If you could also make me presenter. Should be good now. Uh, thanks. Good afternoon. I'm Jamie Cornan. I am the Herring Plan Coordinator for the New England Fishery Management Council. I have a few brief slides and then I'll also show you some similar figures to what Jason presented. So thanks for the opportunity to give a brief update. Um, last week, the Atlantic Herring specifications for the next three fishing years, which one of them we're presently in, started on January 1st of this year, um, were implemented. So that was on March 23rd. Uh, that includes catch limits for herring uh, in all of the management areas, as well as other components, and river herring and shad catch caps for the next three years. The council's proposal was to keep uh, the river herring and shad catch caps that we presently have in place um, constant for the next three fishing years. So these are the numbers. Um, I'll show you a little bit in a moment on this year's in-season performance for these caps. Also, the council has three priorities that are relevant to river herring and shad. Um, the first one is to coordinate with the Mid-Atlantic Council as well as the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission on any herring related issues, and this includes river herring and shad. Um, also, anything related to the 2023 river herring assessment and tasked us with an analysis, uh, the plan development team with an analysis of the combination of factors that may have led to low bycatch estimates in the Atlantic herring fishery for the past three years. Our council will also be revisiting the Amendment 8 inshore midwater trawl closure that was vacated by the courts about a year ago. And our staff will be participating in an upcoming research track assessment of Atlantic herring. If you're interested in knowing when the council plans to discuss these topics, um, starting at the top, we've just accomplished the implementation of those herring and river herring and shad catch caps as are now in place. The next thing, and we've been working on this for some time, the plan development team, which I chair, has been working on an analysis of river herring and shad bycatch estimates. Um, we will work more on this inshore closure issue throughout the year. It's undetermined exactly what the council may do. That's why there's a long stretch of to be determined. Annually, we set council priorities for the next year. That discussion starts about halfway through the year. And then the research stock assessment for herring will get organized with a working group towards the end of the year. So right now is when we're actually digging into more of river herring and shad. We have a plan development team tomorrow. We hold our meetings by webinar. You all are welcome to join and listen in. We have a hearing advisory panel meeting on April 11th and the 12th, the committee meets. The council meets April 18th through the 20th in Mystic, Connecticut. And they also have a webinar option. The public can participate in that meeting in person or by webinar. And we do offer opportunities for public comment um, 
remotely if folks are not able to attend in person. If you're interested in any of these meetings and what the agendas are, you can go to our website, nefmc.org, navigate yourself to hearing management plan, or also look at the council meeting agenda, which is uh, posted now for April. Just quickly, I'll show some similar figures as to what Jason showed, if I can get out of this presentation. There we go. All right. Um, so as I uh, started out the presentation with, recently the hearing specifications were revised and they were put in place last week. Uh, this is the current in-season performance of each of the management areas, 1A, 1B, 2, and 3, and the percent of the quota caught relative to those catch limits. This is just for Atlantic herring now. Uh, two of those areas did close prior to this due to um, catches exceeding or projected to be close to the uh, ACLs in those areas. We also are monitoring GARFO. These are, these are from GARFO as well. Um, uh, in season, the river herring and shad catch caps. Uh, the one that is approaching right now is the one that covers Cape Cod for the midwater trawl fishery. Um, so there are four areas, Cape Cod, and they're separate by gear type. Um, and here you can see the, um, the values uh, of the quota on the red line, and then the in-season catches, that's the blue dash line that you see. So like what Jason was mentioning with macro, we are seeing uh, a similar trend in this Cape Cod area, um, and then somewhat of a, a trend in Southern New England bottom trawl, but we're watching those to see what happens. When they do close, they close to directed fishing of herring in those areas. And I can send you the links for these um, in-season monitoring pages as well. And that's what I have for my update, and I can pause and take any questions. Thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, if anyone has questions, raise your hand or enter into the questions box. If Jamie, if you can send me the uh, the link, I'm sure I have it. But if you don't mind, just um, sending along, I'll make sure that it goes out in the the meeting recap. Uh, following this meeting to, to everybody on the uh, forum distribution list, just uh, if anybody wants to take a deeper dive. And my apologies, I, I think I called you the Northeastern Council, not the New England Council. I misspoke there. My hand raise uh, went away, but I'll just note that um, to remind folks, you can't add the Heron, you can add the herring caps, but you can't add the herring and the mackerel caps because there's overlap and some of the river herring counted in each, the herring and mackerel are the same herring. Um, so I just always remind people you can't add between uh, the Atlantic herring and Atlantic mackerel river herring and shad caps. Thanks, Jason. Um, and, and Jamie, again, thanks. I, I don't see any hands raised or any questions. So, um, you know, with that, we'll, we can switch over to our first uh, presentation from, from Dan Stitch. Looks like we're, we're running pretty close on time, which is great. So, um, yeah. um, can you see my slides now? Yes. Um, and I'm not sure where to turn the camera on, or can you see me already? Um, the camera, let's see, it's on like the little toolbar near where you unmute or mute your microphone. You should have a camera icon right oh, now okay. if, you'd like, if yeah. you'd like to turn it on. Um, sure. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so today I'm going to be... Um, presenting some results from a large collaborative study that one, um, we, one second Carrie sorry to interrupt um, but <laughs> I think are we seeing we can see the tabs on the side uh, we can see like the next slide it, it's let's see oh, we're still no. we're not seeing oh I see you're not I'm it for me it's um, 
uh, it's in screen. Uh, I mean, I just see my presenter slides. Um, That's better. Yep. You've you've got it. Yes. That looks good. Okay. Um, how do I get rid of? Okay. Can you still see me? I mean, and see the slides. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so let me see, where was I? Okay, yes, yeah, so um, today I'm going to be presenting um, some of our results from a large collaborative um, project where we were uh, aiming to estimate the spatial and temporal genetic stock composition of river herring um, bycatch in southern New England fisheries. Mm -hmm. It won't let me change my slide. Ah, there we go. All right, so um, as you all know, since the 1970s, there's been a marked decline in um, river herring spawning numbers. And there's a number of factors that are contributing to this, including uh, river herring being caught in large fisheries, both initially as targeted uh, catches and more recently as bycatch, and also due to loss of spawning habitat um, through through damming or suitable spawning habitat through damming and um, freshwater pollution. There are mitigation plans in place which include restoration um, through the removal of dams and building of fishways which are connecting anadromous species back to their um, previous uh, freshwater spawning habitats and also volunteer bycatch avoid avoidance efforts. However, further research is still required to understand um, um, how to um, properly conserve and manage um, river herring. And in particular, um, what we were interested in is the origins, the, the rivers and regions of origin um, of bycatch, particularly around southern New England. So one of the ways that you can um, do this is using genetics um, through um, estimating mixing proportions from uh, using range-wide genetic baselines. Um, so what I mean by that is I have a little illustration here on the side. So we can imagine we have a species and it has three um, genetic groups here represented by different colors. And what we want to be able to do is collect um, samples within this um, block in the ocean away from where the fish originates and then we want to be able to estimate the proportions of those samples we collect that come from each of our um, our genetic um, our regional genetic groups um, and so you can imagine this tool is extremely useful um, for anadromous species and for estimating bycatch so um, to do this, we first need to establish um, or understand the population structure of the species throughout its range. So we want to answer questions like how many regional genetic groups are there? What is the extent of gene flow and strain between these groups? And where are the transitions, transition zones of these groups? Um, if we have a genetic baseline that has sufficient genetic differentiation, this then allows us to estimate the stock proportions and the individual assignments of fish uh, through genetic comparisons back to this reference, these reference populations. Um, there's some other features of your genetic baseline that are really useful. For example, you want it to be easily expandable, so as as you do more studies and as other labs do studies, that those new populations or new sites that are genotype can be added into your baseline. And you also want it to be portable between labs. So you want those markers to be easily transferable and scorable. And finally, um, a good genetic baseline, you want it to be as large as possible. So you want it to be really amenable to high throughput um, capabilities that are available. So the first um, study that was done to understand um, population structure and uh, estimate bycatch proportions in river herring, so both alewife and blueback herring, was done with microsatellite baseline. It was the same microsatellites for both species. So what we're looking at here on the left hand side is um, uh, the range of alewife and um, we can see the rivers that were sampled here on the right. 
Um, so in this case, each line in this plot is an individual and the color is associated with the ancestry group. So the initial LY population genetic study um, along the, uh, the coast of the USA found three regional groups and these were used as three reporting groups. So reporting groups are just gr groups of rivers um, that are genetically similar and will be one of the groups that we then test against to see how many fish from a mixed group assigned back to that group of origin, right? So we had three groups in alewife. In blueback herring, um, the same set of microsatellites were used. Um, here on the right, we can see the rivers that were included in the baseline, and we can see there were four regional groups. So this baseline of alewife and blueback herring was a total of around 2,000 fish. Um, so one of the first things that they did was they took their whole data set, so bycatch being caught in this uh, West Atlantic region, shown here for alewife and here for blueback herring, and they found that the majority of alewife were coming from the southern New England reporting group, um, and the rivers included are highlighted here in blue. And for um, blueback herring, they found that the largest proportion of bycatch in their data set was coming from these green rivers here, right, the Mid-Atlantic reporting group. Um, so what the study showed was that there were independent regional genetic groups. However, the boundaries of these transition zones were not that clear. And another um, uh, issue that came up was that although another study genotyped a number of Canadian rivers, so extending the range, it was not possible to add that data set in with this baseline. So the goals of our studies were to firstly increase the range-wide baselines to include samples from Canada, but also a, a lot um, uh, more dense sampling throughout the, the US range. And so we increased the baseline from around 2,000 fish to over 8,000 fish. Um, we developed species-specific SNP panels, so meaning one SNP panel specific for alewife and one for blueback herring to maximize our, chance, our chances of detecting um, additional population structure that was not picked up by the um, microsatellite data set. Um, and these SNPs are also um, a lot more amenable to high throughput genotyping and also more portable uh, among labs. We then started from scratch estimating range-wide population structure and um, with the aims of identifying additional reporting groups if that was possible, if we had the, enough genetic differentiation to um, support additional reporting groups. Um, finally, we extended pearl bycatch um, sampling by two more years and also regenotyped the samples collected in the first study. Um, and then we estimated mortality within a region that was um, both high bycatch incidence and we had a large sampling effort, which meant we could get accurate estimates of mortality for that region. Okay, so here just briefly, the um, alewife genetic baseline, as you can see, it spans um, the, the most of the range of alewife and we had um, intensive sampling. Um, uh, so we had around 100 rivers, um, um, over 5,000 um, uh, individuals, and these were all adults collected from freshwater habitats. Um, we also uh, sampled 28 rivers temporally um, so that we could um, see if our baseline was changing through time. Um, and then for blueback herring, we sampled 42 rivers, so over 2,000 samples in this baseline. Um, and again, um, using the same sampling strategy as alewife with 10 um, rivers that we sampled temporally. Okay. So the alewife results, um, so this is the same kind of plotting as we saw earlier. So we can see each of the populations that were sampled and their assignment to specific um, regional genetic groups. We found um, that um, our data supported four large regional genetic groups. I'd like to point out that you might see some populations that don't match their 
um, the populations around them. Um, these are generally um, populations that had um, uh, records of stocking, um, and those are not particularly useful for our baselines. So there were a, cu a couple of um, locations that we removed, for example, Dresden Mills, due to its stocking history. Um, in addition to these larger um, regional genetic groups, we also found significant differentiation between almost all of our rivers and basins, which pointed to um, additional hierarchical structure that um, could support uh, additional reporting groups besides the four, in, the four major groups in alewife. For blueback herring, we found uh, five regional groups um, that were supported, and again, um, significant differentiation between most of the rivers and basins. Um, so to identify these reporting groups, and again, reporting groups are groups of rivers that, were, that we um, clustered together and assigned back. Um, our mixed, our mixed uh, samples too. So um, we tried out a number of different combinations that were informed both by our genetic results and uh, those that would be informative um, for um, conservation and management. And um, we ended up identifying um, 10 regional, um, sorry, reporting groups in alewife um, that we felt had um, really accurate estimates for uh, mixing proportions, and we also found 10 in blueback herring. In the southern range of blueback herring, we actually had quite a lot of structure to the point where we could even have individual rivers um, as their own reporting groups. Um, but you can see, sorry, going back to Elwife, that around southern New England, instead of having a large region with um, that was all grouped together, we were able to break that down into some smaller clusters um, of rivers and the same for blueback herring. Okay, this is just briefly to explain our simulation. So basically how it works is we estimate uh, or we uh, simulate um, known samples from the different reporting groups that we've assigned and then we use the software to estimate these proportions and we assess the correlation. If we get a high correlation between um, our true proportions and our estimated proportions, then we're satisfied um, that those reporting groups uh, will be informative. And so um, we were happy with these sets of reporting groups for alewife and blueback herring. Okay, so the data set, our bycatch data set that we are now gonna compare back to that um, genetic baseline, this included samples from 2012 to 2015 from these um, stat areas indicated in um, the map on the right. So we have Cape Cod, we have a group Long Island Sound, Block Island Sound, um, a group that we called Southern New England and New Jersey, Long Island. Okay. Um, we analyzed this data set in two ways. The first as a whole data set so that we could compare our mixing proportion estimates in the same way um, to the first study. And then we also did half winter groupings where we took samples um, that were collected, um, for example, from December to January within these stat area groupings. Um, and we anal analyzed them as uh, individual um, collections. Um, so we genotyped over 5,000 individuals for alewife and um, around 1,400 um, fish for blueback herring. And just a technical point, any group that we had that was less than 20 individuals, we filtered out because the mixing proportion estimates um, are, are less accurate below 20. So, you know, trying to keep the data set robust. Um, so, okay, looking at those overall proportions from the from the range, so we're starting up from Canada, move, moving southwards. So for alewife, you can see that those Canadian um, reporting groups are not contributing very much to bycatch around southern New England. Um, but we do see um, large proportions, as was seen before, from that group of rivers that previously made up southern New England. So we see that our highest proportions are coming from the, these few rivers of Block Island Sound, um, then from Long Island Sound, Nantucket, 
and um, also um, the Mid-Atlantic. And I'll talk about the Mid-Atlantic fish a little later on. Um, in um, blueback herring, we kind of see the opposite pattern. We don't see a lot of the southern reporting groups represented in our um, uh, bycatch events around southern New England, but we do see a large uh, proportion of mid-Atlantic and um, some higher proportions of northern New England. Um, another thing to note is that um, these rivers that make up Long Island Sound, southern New England, and um, um, mid -New, uh, New England, um, those populations are um, quite low. So the fact that we see them um, in some proportions in the bycatch is um, likely to be important. Um, okay, so now we're looking at those hot winter designations, and as you can see, there's quite a bit of variability, but we are seeing in basically each bycatch um, grouping are uh, the same um, reporting groups represented. Again, pointing out that during 2013, we see more mid-Atlantic fish within this Long Island Sound, Block Island Sound um, region, but quite a lot of variation across the stat areas. And same for blueback herring. Mostly we're seeing mid-Atlantic fish, but we do see um, some variation and um, around Cape Cod, um, some, some fish from Canada. Um, right, so as I mentioned, um, we wanted to understand um, actual mortality estimates, and to do this accurately, we needed to, to focus on a region where we had really good sampling efforts, um, and that is represented here by this purple polygon. So what we did was we excluded any fish from our data set that did not occur in the polygon, and we re-estimated our mixing proportion estimates, and then we combined that with the mortality estimates to have an idea of how many fish for these different reporting groups um, uh, were, were dying. Right, so on the right we have the estimates of um, mortality for each of the half winter designations, um, and as you see in 2013 there was a large by uh, or a lot more bycatch um, across the, the 2013 half winters. So during the duration of our study, we estimated around 4.6 million alewife and 1.2 million blueback herring were taken. Um, when we look at our mixing proportion estimates combined with our, our mortality estimates for this target region, we see that in each year we're seeing um, the same um, reporting groups being represented, right, as we saw before, Block Island Sound and Tucket Long Island Sound. But interestingly, there's a large proportion of mid-Atlantic fish, particularly in 2013, when we see the, um, that higher, that increase in bycatch mortality. So that, um, um, that points to us that there's actually two things going on. One, we're consistently taking from the same reporting groups, but two, we're also sporadically um, some, uh, or catching um, uh, fish that might be migrating through the reef, through the area. For blueback herring, we see the same patterns as we saw in the larger data set. Most of the mortality is coming from that mid-Atlantic reporting group. Um, yeah, so just to conclude, um, we have now established a much larger range-wide um, genetic baseline, um, and we've shown that we can get um, accurate estimates um, for um, quite a few additional reporting groups that are informing um, uh, or providing us with more fine-scale resolution of where our bycatch is coming from. Um, so I'd just like to end by um, thanking um, all the people or all the organizations that funded this research. Of course, everyone who helped in this extensive sampling effort that was required for these two large data sets. And of course, the technicians who helped with the lab work. Um, so yeah, does anybody have any questions? And several of the other authors are also on this call. So uh, they'll definitely um, jump in and um, provide some, some more answers and feedback. Great, thank you so much for that presentation, Carrie. And 
you know, again, really appreciate you calling in, um, you know, in the middle of the night, your local time to, to give this talk about this recent paper. Um, really interesting findings there. It looks like we have uh, one hand up from Wilson Laney, um, but yeah, I encourage folks to um, raise their hand or enter questions into the question box and we'll, we'll get to them in the time that we have. So can you hear me? Yes. Hey, thanks. Uh, great presentation, Kerry. Thank you so much. Um, has it been published yet? And if not, when will we be able to see a, a final publication? Yes, it actually just came out in January. Um, it's in Canadian Journal of Fishery Science and it's open access. So oh, um, it would be easy great, to get hold of. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, we'll be sure to uh, send a link out to that publication in the meeting recap so folks can find it. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, Kevin. And then, and just, Thanks, Giano. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Carrie, for presenting this. Appreciate it. And uh, I just wanted to like kind of speak a little bit more towards what you said about seeing you know, those really low numbers and blueback herring and Long Island sounds. I just kind of wanted to, for everybody's, um, you know, background on this, know that during the years of this study, the passage at Holyoke Dam for blueback herring um, was between 39 and 976 individuals, which isn't a lot, but when you compare it to 1985, there were 632,000. Um, so just, you know, the fact that they showed up at all is, it's, it's, you know, fairly amazing because we're actually starting to face, at least here in Connecticut anyway, um, you know, we passed statewide last year 570 blueback herring. So we we essentially do not see blueback herring anymore here in Connecticut. So thank you, Carrie. Appreciate it. Great. And, and Carrie, you did get one um, shout out uh, from Carlos Garza saying excellent presentation, just FYI. <laughs> I can't, yeah, I'm, I'm still st stuck in the full screen mode, so I can't actually see anything. Um, how do I get out of this? Ah, <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, we've, we'll, we'll take one more question from um, Bill Lucy, and then uh, we'll have to move over to Dan Stitch's presentation, and uh, it, yeah, we can follow up if, if Terry has time to, to hang on after the, uh, um, that, you know, for the open discussion, if we need to follow up there, we can. Um, or if, you know, if other authors stay on during that period, we can we can follow up there if folks have lingering questions. Um, and then I, I will say for anybody who hopped on in the middle of Carrie's presentation, expecting to see Dan's presentation, um, apologies, we had to change the order um, due to some technical difficulties, but the meeting is being recorded. So um, anyway, uh, go ahead, Bill, and uh, and then we'll we'll move on. There. Yeah, just really quick. Um, fantastic presentation, Kerry. Uh, did you guys um, consider looking at mitochondrial DNA, like AT pump sites or anything like that, or are you just strictly looking at SNPs? No, for this data set, given how large it is, and and we we just do uh, fluidine SNP genotyping. Um, I think that. I'm not sure. I might. Um, some of my other the other co-authors could clarify, but I believe due to the small amounts of integration between alewife and blueback herring, that um, mitochondrial DNA might not be the best marker in this case because um, you know you would have to couple it with nuclear data to get a really clear si uh, signal. Um, but yeah, ours is just SNP nuclear SNP genotype data. Okay. Thank you. That's that's great. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, really appreciate you calling in uh, all the way from from Hong Kong to uh, to give this presentation. So uh, I think I think it may be a force a first for the forum to have a <laughs> uh, somebody from the other hemisphere calling in. So this is great. Yeah, no problem. Great, thanks. Okay, how do I end this? Up? Great. All right. Do we have? Does Dan Dan were you able to get your microphone working? It's not uh, sharing your screen anymore. It will, ah, there it is. All right. And let's try one of those. Can you see my face? Yes. Yep. All right, this ought to be weird. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. I apologize for the technical difficulties. 
And I'm going to hold my phone to my mouth like this for now so I don't have to listen to myself talk. We all know how weird that is. Uh, I appreciate the invite today um, and was really spurred on by Wes Eakin, uh, one of the co-authors here. So um, before I get rocking and rolling here, uh, I just want to recognize Wes and Greg Kenny uh, with Cornell University in D.C. Uh, who have really helped uh, push this work along and kind of uh, were the impetus for some of what we're uh, looking at here today. Uh, so these are models that are similar to uh, the habitat models that we've been talking about making for blueback herring and owlwife that John mentioned at the start of the call. Uh, it's slightly different, but many of the same kinds of assumptions. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is trying to use some uh, simulation models to try and predict the response of blueback herring access to habitat in the Mo upper, Mo uh, upper Hudson and uh, Mohawk River. Uh, so this is a slide for folks who aren't used to talking about Shad and River herring. Uh, this uh, really just kind of broad-based intro. And uh, what I really wanted to just tease out of here for this one is that uh, among those uh, impediments to, uh, or, or I should say, those causes for historical declines in abundance and impediments to recovery, um, dams and fisheries still loom large in, in many of our uh, conversations. So if we started to zero down a little more specifically to uh, the Mohawk and Hudson rivers uh, that we're gonna talk about today, get a quick overview of the watershed. It looks something like this. Uh, for blueback herring, the historical habitat probably would have been about the blue here with a little bit up into the, the pinkish purple color. Uh, I'm gonna call the blue part on, on this map, the lower Hudson River. Uh, I'll refer to the pink part over here where I'm circling with my mouse as the upper Hudson. And then we'll also look at um, some uh, developing interests out in the Mohawk watershed. Uh, so there's a lot of dams in this system. A lot of them are hydro, but many of them are also navigational or for uh, water level regulation, which isn't something a lot of us are used to thinking about when we think about fish passage. So this is kind of a, a little bit of a novel um, perspective on some of these things. But we've also got this ongoing history of human change over the course of the last several hundred years on the east coast of the United States. Uh, in, in the Hudson watershed, one of the major changes that we're talking about here is actually the formation of the canal system, both through the upper Hudson River, the Champlain Canal, and through the Mohawk River, the Erie or Barge Canal. Uh, and so this is uh, just a cute little bit of lithograph showing how this uh, influenced human commerce and change, westward expansion, etc. cetera. Uh, but it wasn't just us that found our ways upstream uh, through the Mohawk. Well, I guess we didn't really do that, uh, but also did blueback herring. And, and so now we know that river herring makes at least some use of the Mohawk River uh, and have expanded that range westward. This is a little bit of a graphical look at that. Uh, the plot on the left shows what we kind of think about as the historical range of blueback herring in the Hudson River. You can see that's confined to mostly the lower Hudson River uh, this is downstream of Troy Federal Dam for folks uh, who are used to thinking about this system. And the graph on the right is showing a little bit of an expansion. Um, well, we won't call it expansion, maybe um, passage into historical habitat in the Hubbard. Upper Hudson River uh, towards the right. And then this long uh, dog leg out to the west is the Mohawk River. And uh, we've seen fish as far out as the Great Lakes uh, that appear to be of Hudson River uh, origin there. So this has got a lot of folks interested. Uh, we've got fish moving up into novel, novel habitats through uh, navigational lock and dam systems. Um, this is not necessarily an intentional fish passage thing. Um, these are fish making the most of what they've got uh, in terms of access to spawning habitat. So the fundamental sort of management question of interest here is whether or not this is a good thing for those fish. Um, and a little bit more specifically, folks were really interested in understanding whether the Mohawk and Hudson River, uh, sorry, the access to the Mohawk River through the lock and dam system uh, currently acts as a source or, or a sink in terms of the population dynamics. 
So if you've never seen a um, an engineering schematic of the New York Canal system, this is it. Uh, and what you're looking at here in the center, this this long line that runs end to end, is the uh, Mohawk River Barge Canal system. Uh, and so if you start over here on the far right or east of that uh, schematic, you've got a really quick rise up uh, five or six locks, the Waterford Flight of Locks there near Albany, uh, and then a more gradual ascent into uh, the, the really the western edge of the natural Mohawk uh, Basin and, and eventually into the Oneida Lake watershed. For our purposes, we're going to stop uh, the simulation uh, work somewhere right around uh, Oneida Lake in Rome, New York. But the reason why folks are considering whether this is a good thing for blueback herring populations is that these all represent opportunities not only for us for habitat access, but also for mortality during downstream passage. The concern here is that uh, passing fish upstream is a really good thing until um, they're at Paris and, and many of them die on the way down. So we wanna be able to identify some of those trade trade-offs. In order to do this, right now we're working out of some existing models. These are uh, packed freely available, open access, open source in the uh, Shadia package for R, uh, previously created to house American Shad models from the Penobscot River, Connecticut River, Kennebec, Merrimack, and a handful of others. Uh, so we're adapting, we've adapted this framework uh, with some system and species specific data, uh, and we're going to incorporate those into that existing modeling framework to start to ask some questions. If you're not familiar with this framework, that's fine. Uh, we'll take a minute to kind of break that open and look at it here. Uh, what you've got is separation of, in this case, blueback herring life history into two different components. We've got an individual-based upstream migration model for spawners uh, that are running up, upstream each spring. That's the dark gray area uh, in this, this uh, schematic. And uh, within that model each year, we can uh, draw a spawning pool from uh, adult fish that are sitting out in the ocean. We can make up the number of starting fish or, or inform that if we've got reasonable information. Uh, we can assign ages, sexes based on sex ratios, fork lengths based on growth rates. Uh, we can draw a number of spawners from that uh, ocean population uh, based on uh, virgin spawning, uh, uh, sorry, maturity curves. Um, and then we can uh, assign them river entry dates, uh, uh, spawning dates, et cetera, based on relationships to temperature, photo period, et cetera, and even assign you know, a path choice, say, uh, into the Mohawk River or the Hudson River in this case that we're interested in. So we use all of this to make up a bunch of individual fish, and then we put them into a river and we allow them to move upstream. The fish are allowed to move upstream based on all, all kinds of relatively specific rules, um, but really one of the things that uh, determines whether they move further upstream or not is uh, they encounter dams as they go. Uh, and we can assign uh, time-based passage efficiencies to upstream passage through those dams for adults, uh, working with daily uh, passage rates in this example. And then fish are allowed to move through those dams uh, based on that probability of success. Uh, and through this movement and passage or not of dams, fish distribute themselves geographically in the watershed into these production units or PUs um, from one till however many we have. Uh, now those are delineated based on, on presence or absence of dams there. Then based on the amount of habitat um, that is in those reaches, uh, we can allow the fish to spawn, uh, recruit young, and we group everybody back together and send them back downstream. Uh, we, at this point, we're grouping all uh, male and female adults together. We're grouping all of the juveniles together as cohorts, and it's a matter of um, some fat, fancy matrix math to get them downstream and back out to the ocean where fish incur marine mortality rates, uh, they uh, in incur natural mortality uh, and any other number of things that we wanna do to them while they're in the ocean until we redraw the spawning pool the following year. So that's the big picture overview of how these models work. I wanna give you a quick peek under the hood to look at some of the information that we actually incorporate into these. Uh, and so we'll look at some habitat data, life history data, and environmental data that we've worked into these models for blueback herring. 
This figure is showing a map of the watershed, the mouth of the Hudson Rivers in the extreme south of the map, uh, and the inset box uh, towards the center of, of the watershed uh, is uh, the location of our first hydropower dams. The furthest south is going to be uh, the Federal Dam in Troy, New York. Uh, that can, uh, once Fisher pass that, they may turn west and go up the Waterford Flight of Locks to ascend into the Mohawk River. Uh, right now, there's no passage through this route with black dots, uh, although fish, in theory, could come down through there. Uh, or the fish may go up into the upper Hudson River. We're not really sure to what degree fish do either of those things right now, so we looked at a wide variety of scenarios. And then each of these white circles on the map or in the inset are dams that, at which we can assess upstream passage of adults, the spawners, uh, and downstream passage of juveniles and adults. We can then incorporate some system-specific life history data. So New York State DC has been great about providing these data, uh, same data I think that go into uh, the um, state, uh, statewide sustainable fishery management plan that are being worked into the ongoing stock assessment now. Uh, this is just one example of those kinds of data. Uh, here you're looking at von Bertalanffy growth curves. Uh, you've got age on the x-axis, total length in millimeters on the y-axis. Uh, and you see we're fitting a curve um, for observed length at age. The cool thing about these is we get all kinds of neat life history parameters that we can yet then use to make inference about other components of life history in the absence of uh, very robust data, like, for example, indirect mortality estimates and things like that. Um, so we've got all kinds of cool information from DEC about this. And then finally, we can incorporate some environmental variability here, just an example of uh, different simulated temperatures uh, on a given day of year that we can use to inform uh, the environmental end of, of our model. So I'm gonna take you through some scenarios here briefly. Uh, won't talk about many of them in great detail, especially on this slide, uh, but I want you to see what we're working with here. So we'll look at uh, uh, how historical, uh, access to historical habitat in the upper Hudson watershed uh, affects uh, the population abundance or predicted population abundance in the watershed, I should say. And that's gonna be with respect to the number of spawners in the watershed. Uh, and then once we've looked at the upper Hudson River, we'll take a glance at the Mohawk River as well. Um, we'll look at a couple of the same scenarios and try to understand uh, how population size changes uh, with a proportion of fish that use the Mohawk. And then we'll layer on some additive mortality factors like uh, mortality during upstream passage of the lock is current concern to managers right now, uh, in addition to marine fishery mortality uh, as well. Cool, so let's jump right into some results. All the graphs I show you will be set up uh, the same way. Uh, as you see here, we've got upstream passage per day on the x-axis. That's the probability that a given fish passes each day uh, at a dam. These are fixed across all the dams in the watershed for now, trying to get a watershed scale uh, picture of this. On the y-axis, you've got spawning adults and millions uh, and in the colors, you have uh, currently adult downstream survival. The colors will change. Uh, they will always go low red to high purple, like Roy G. Biv, the rainbow. Um, and in this case, the panels are representing uh, different juvenile downstream survival uh, rates through dams. So uh, from left to right, top to bottom, you're looking at increasing juvenile survival through all dams in the watershed from about 50% to about 100%. Uh, the colors again going from that same range for adults from 50 to 100% survival through each dam. And you're looking at how that changes across the X axis. Uh, there's a lot going on in this figure. Uh, a couple of really big takeaways though, is if we go from uh, that dashed line, which is uh, no fish passage at all, no upstream passage, uh, to the far bottom right plot, which is uh, all fish passage in purple, so no dams, you see that we've got the potential to increase the population abundance by a little more than double here. An average of 1.7 million fish predicted in the absence of fish passage and an average of about 4.9 million fish 
uh, predicted in uh, the absence of dams. And somewhere in between is reality, right? Uh, where we've got varying rates of upstream and downstream survival. Um, of note is that, that at the lowest levels of juvenile and adult uh, downstream survival through dams shown, uh, we've got the potential to reduce the population uh, through increased upstream passage. This means that uh, as more, more fish are passed upstream, uh, we need to do a better job passing fish downstream in order to ensure that a population can, continues to grow. If we wanted to see what the scope for increase was, um, given the, the insanely large amount of habitat in the Mohawk River um, that we're modeling right now, um, we could look at how the population changes with increasing probability of using the river. So this scenario is looking at 100% um, uh, downstream survival of both juveniles and adults through the dams um, with a 100% upstream passage. So it's kind of like a no dam or at least a transparent dam thing going on for the fish. And you can see that as we increase the proportion of fish that are using the Mohawk River, we uh, increase the population abundance, the spawning population abundance uh, to a max of around 40 million spawners. Um, and it maybe starts to dip a little bit thereafter because you lose that 4.9 out of the Upper Hudson River if all the fish use the Mohawk. So some, some really large scope for increase here. And what does this look like if we look at the variable uh, passage rates that we talked about for uh, the Upper Hudson River? Uh, here, we're showing uh, juvenile downstream survival from left to right uh, in the columns. Different rates of using the Mohawk River, different probabilities that individual fish use the Mohawk in the rows. So we're increasing from a low probability of fish migrating up into the Mohawk River to a very high probability that fish migrate into the Mohawk River. The adult downstream passage colors are the same, but now we've moved the dashed line to the 4.9 million spawners we would anticipate uh, resulting from access to full historical habitat in the upper Hudson. So the idea here is we're looking for what rates of uh, passage, upstream and downstream passage through dams where we need to increase the population beyond that given novel access to the Mohawk River. So a couple of big trends again, we got a lot going on here. If we go all the way to the top left, we had very low probabilities of using the Mohawk River uh, and lower probabilities of juvenile and adult downstream survival. There is virtually no scenario that increases the population with respect to upstream passage, right? That said, if you go down to the bottom right hand corner of this graph, um, there's where we have very high probability of using the Mohawk, high juvenile survival, and basically any adult survival. Um, there are very few scenarios that would re result in the reduction of the population. So this is kind of the crux of the tr question that we're trying to get after, and it gives us a little bit of a perspective on this. In addition to this, we might like to consider additive mortality sources alongside those. So for this scenario, we're going to simplify things a little bit. We're going to make sure we pick a juvenile survival rate that's going to allow uh, population abundance to increase in the absence of lock mortality. So we went ahead and pulled the, uh, the 0.95 value from Zedleski et al. 2021, that modeling effort. Likewise, for adults, we went and pulled an 80% 80 downstream survival rate. Uh, and an upstream passage probability is somewhere around 40 or 50% per day. Then within our different probabilities of using the Mohawk River, we considered different uh, proportional losses due to lock mortality uh, during upstream passage of the Waterford flight, for example, and, and fix this again across uh, dams. So you can see we get a pretty, um, pretty large proportional reduction from uh, no lock mortality all the way over on the right when a lot of fish are using the Mohawk um, to a to, uh, very few number of fish with um, lock mortality in the case where uh, there's a low probability of using the Mohawk. So again, we're kind of seeing our result um, hinge a little bit on how many fish are, what proportion of fish are actually using the Mohawk River and how effectively they're being passed uh, upstream in this case on the x-axis. Yeah, it didn't fix that one at all. We could also look at um, influences on different uh, 
part of the of the life history. So here we're looking at uh, a marine fishery mortality rate. Uh, we're, we're applying this to the ocean directly. Um, this is, I should say, not considering the directed uh, recreational commercial harvest down in the lower Hudson River. Well, we can talk about that in a few as well. Um, and set up is much the same. Uh, you have your highest spawner abundances at your lowest marine fishery mortality, uh, your lowest abundances at the highest marine fishery mortality. In fact, if you harvest 100% of your fish, you have no fish left. Um, and you see we have more or less a linear decrease uh, both uh, across increased probabilities of using the Mohawk River and across the range of uh, marine fishery mortality rates considered. And then we got really crazy and said, what if we stick these things together? And so we did that. Uh, and so we're looking at the same uh, two sets of scenarios here, but we've narrowed the scope a little bit. We're looking at the lower end of lock mortalities per dam because uh, we knew that uh, we were predicting that, that populations could increase with those. Again, we're trying to identify thresholds. Uh, and we're looking at the lower end of marine fishery mortality rates that were allowing the population to increase in the previous slide. Uh, and you can see that just what you would anticipate here uh, is, is the combined effects of those um, have the potential to be the least uh, as great as the, as the sum. Um, and as in upstream passage uh, per day increases, we get this sort of same nonlinear response we might anticipate out of the lock mortality per dam. So to summarize that, uh, with when we look at this, access to historical habitat in the upper Hudson River uh, with unimpeded access, we've got potential to double this population or, or more uh, really, um, but that there are some pretty important thresholds for that. When either the adult or the juvenile survival drops too low, uh, we're dropping below predicted abundances um, if we pass no fish at all. Uh, likewise, you've got potential for huge, huge increases in abundance because of access to novel habitat in the Mohawk River, um, but we've got some minimum thresholds that would need to be met for that to happen. Across the range of parameters, we identified many more scenarios that resulted in increased abundance uh, in the absence of our additive mortality sources, uh, but that doesn't mean they're more likely, right? Uh, and so one of the, the big question marks out there right now is what, what is the proportion of uh, spawning blueback herring that um, attempt to use the Mohawk River um, and what are what what do those upstream passage efficiencies look like at the dams because it looks like that's kind of going to be the clincher um, about whether or not access for these spawning fish uh, is source or sink and would be the determinant of what degree uh, additive mortality sources such as lock mortality, uh, marine fisheries, uh, in, directed in-river fisheries um, have the potential to, to limit these populations. Um, I will say uh, that the timing of uh, Carrie's paper that uh, we just heard about was serendipitous um, because we've been able to start thinking a little bit more about the scope of population limitation based on some of the mortality rates that they've identified and what we're predicting out of these models. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, everybody, uh, Cornell University uh, for funding DC. Uh, it's been great to work with on this, um, canals and, and folks uh, other places around for their candor. Thanks, Dan. Uh, it's a lot to digest there, <laughs> um, but seems just like an incredibly powerful tool to, um, you know, to use in terms of, uh, you know, conservation restoration planning. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. We are running a little behind due to um, the technical difficulties. I see Matt Best has his hand up. Um, did you want to? Ask a question, Matt. And if anybody else has questions, raise your hand or put them in the chat. We'll we'll um, try and switch over to updates here in, in the next you know, three minutes or so. Matt, you're unmuted on our end, so should be able to unmute when you're ready. Weird. For some reason, yeah, he didn't have a question for you, Dan. So, <laughs> um, 
he's, it, it, for some reason, his hand's been going up. Um, anyway, uh, so Dan, I guess it, this work, is, is it associated with, I do have a question, is it, is it associated with the benchmark stock assessment um, similar to uh, you know what you guys did for the um, American Shad benchmark stock assessment. You'll be, I, I assume these, this study will have bearing on on that. Is that correct? Um, that's a great question. This one actually started a couple years ago. Um, so we are hoping to put together some habitat-based models, like we did for the American Shad stock assessment. Stock assessment. Sorry, it's so weird hearing my own voice in my ear. Um, but these are not those exact models. They're very similar in nature. Um, the larger models are uh, more generic and easier to extend to other systems. And they let us look at a much larger number of populations at a given time. The, the models that we're working with on the Mohawk are um, big and nasty and complex. It's a, it's, I mean, it's a really complex system. It's like you you dove in on um, one of the more complex systems up on the East Coast, I would assume, in terms of asking the questions you have with the number of dams and novel habitats and all those those kinds of things. I assume you could um, remove some of that complexity, but then expand it out. Is that is that a possibility? Is that something you're interested in pursuing? Yeah, that's exactly right. So the hope is that by removing some of the individual-based modules and stuff like that, um, we can generalize things. It turns out it doesn't make a ton of difference in the projections that you're pulling out of based on like comparing models for rivers where we have both of them, for American Shad anyway, uh, which, which is kind of nice to know. So yeah, that's um, exactly simplify and generalize more easily. Okay, um, Matt did actually enter a question in the chat. He asked if uh, if River Herring or I guess Blueback were excluded from the locks, would those excluded fish increase productivity in the Hudson? I don't know. It wouldn't, if they were excluded from the locks, I don't know. It depends on, you know, do they get to the dam, they can't get any further where they quote unquote want to get and so they just leave or do they go back and do they spawn in the estuary and then given that these models all are based on assumptions of carrying capacity, the prediction from the models would be that no, they don't contribute to increased growth without access because at some points at some point you hit a carrying capacity below the most downstream dam but in in real life i don't know right right gotcha okay um well thanks for sharing this work and i assume it it's not published correct it, it will be at, at some point in the near future this one is at a journal right now okay we will um we'll be sure to uh send that link out once it once it hits the streets um if, if folks were interested in, in taking a, a deeper look at it um but but again thanks so much for for getting a presentation together and and uh sorting through all the um the technical issues we had here i'm glad uh, the landline uh worked for you there <laughs> um so great um with that we can uh, move on to the general updates and um since we're running a bit behind and i am um the first update uh, and it's it's kind of an update I, I gave at the last River Hearing Forum meeting. Um, I will uh, keep it really brief. Um, if, if folks were at the uh, fall 2022 River Hearing Forum meeting, you'll you'll recall um, we at, at No Fisheries, along with ASMFC and, and some other folks, are working on an, uh, a 2015 uh, or sorry uh, River Hearing Habitat Conservation Plan, which is an update from the 2015 um, Technical Expert Working Group um, Habitat Plan and um, just wanted to let folks know that we are still diligently working on getting that out. It should be published in our Garfo policy series um, next month, hopefully. Um, if not, then you know, gosh, May at the latest, um, we will we will get it out there um, very soon. And and once it once it's published, we will uh, be sure to uh, send that out to the to the group. And we'll be interested to hear you know what folks find useful about it. Um, if there's any feedback on that, 
certainly open to it. Um, I think, Dan, are you, uh, I think I can still hear you through the mic. Um, that, may be, that may have done it. Ironically, um, my computer microphone, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, great. And um, with that, Jim uh, Turek from the Restoration Center was going to give a, an update on the funding opportunities. Again, we are running a bit behind, and I apologize, folks. Um, but he was going to give an update on those uh, funding opportunities associated with the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law. Jim, are you ready to go? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Jim Turek. If you, you don't know me, I work for the No Restoration Center out of uh, Narragansett, Rhode Island. And uh, I'm just gonna give a brief update on, oops, there goes the slides. <laughs> there yep. we go. They come back, okay. Yeah, they came back, okay. Uh, so I was just gonna give a brief update on, um, you know, what has transpired from uh, fiscal year 22 uh, regarding NOAA um, by uh, partisan infrastructure law uh, funding. And, uh, and then we're gonna go in very quickly and, what's coming along now. Um, so anyway, uh, in fiscal 22, uh, there uh, of course were, there were four solicitations that went out <laughs> over time, two of which focused directly on fish passage, and then uh, two others that were uh, also had a link to fish passage, uh, but also other types of, uh, of restoration and uh, coastal and community resilience. Um, but anyway, in 22, there was a total of about $105 million that were funding, funded in, uh, at the end of the year or early this year, uh, plus another $61 million for future uh, years under these three-year uh, grant awards uh, for a total of 36 uh, fish passage projects throughout the country. And, um, and, and of those 36, 15 of those projects uh, were focused on uh, projects that were led by tribes uh, uh, or uh, greatly um, uh, partnered with tribal tribal organizations. And so that that uh, 26 million that are associated with those 15 uh, awards uh, are associated with both implementing fish passage or building uh, tribal capacity for being able to handle uh, fish passage projects in the future. And then if we break it down further of those 36 nationwide projects, 10 of them occurred along the Atlantic coast, therefore having at least hopefully uh, um, uh, benefits to, uh, to, to river herring. And uh, breaking that down, there were four awards in Maine, which included the, uh, the uh, project uh, associated with the Woodland Dam uh, uh, being led by the Maine Department of Marine Resources. There were then uh, also uh, two tribal uh, projects, uh, one through the Penobscot Indian Nation and the other one through the pa Passamaquoddy tribe, uh, such as the uh, Great Falls Dam in the photo on the lower right. And that's looking at uh, some type of either tentacle or nature-like fishway for that site. Um, and then additionally, there's also a, another uh, award in Maine through the Atlantic Salmon Federation. In addition, there was a, there was a project in New Hampshire uh, through, through the town of Durham on the Oyster River, that's a river herring project. Uh, two in Massachusetts, including uh, one that looks at multiple priority barriers in the Ipswich River watershed associated with the Great Marsh. And that's, I think, on the order of about 25 different barriers that are being looked at uh, and will be multi-phased uh, from you know, planning, design, and implementation over the three-year period. Uh, and then moving down uh, to in a southerly direction, there are two projects in Massachusetts. Um, I'm sorry, I covered one already. Uh, the other one was uh, uh, Mattaquat uh, River in Braintree with the town of Braintree. And then further south in Connecticut uh, was an award to the Naugatuck Valley Council of Governments to work on the removal of the Kinneytown Dam. And then lastly, two projects in North Carolina, one going to American Rivers and the other one, the Nature Conservancy. So um, some great work, uh, you know, that uh, hopefully will be accomplished with these funds from uh, last year. And then, we'll, like I said, we'll extend out for three years, a three-year period. Um, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> and so what, what's uh, as important today to tell you a little bit about is 
the uh, notice of funding opportunities that are going to come out this fiscal year. And again, these are going to be three-year awards. And um, and so the intent is, uh, you know, uh, of course, the best products they have are shovel-ready ones that can go right into construction. But as we know, in many cases, it, it requires, uh, you know, more time and uh, project phases to get to some of these projects. And so if you think about it, uh, it these funds can be used for early uh, planning assessment, moving into design, permitting, and then construction uh, phases uh, or any uh, starting point thereof to, to get to a project uh, 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 to completion. And so, um, th so the first one, the National Fish Passage one, and these are all tentative. We, we, you know, we we listen typically as uh, uh, regional staff on a, a week by or biweekly basis from folks at headquarters to give us any updates. And the latest updates we've had is that the uh, the tentative date for the National Fish Passage will be in May. And it sounds to me it's similarly the Tribal Fish Passage will be uh, likely in late May, early June. And then the following by the transformational restoration NOFO, which includes uh, a gamut of uh, restoration types, uh, including fish passage still, along with uh, many other uh, habitat types, plus uh, a focus on both uh, um, ecological and community resilience. And so, as you might expect, there, there's still open value for applying potentially through transformational and that one will be coming out probably later, uh, at least hopefully by June. And then lastly, we have an underserved community uh, NOFO that will be coming out again, hopefully in, in June. And that is to address uh, uh, communities typically uh, you know, located in more urbanized river systems or watersheds. And uh, it, it certainly has a strong component for uh, capacity building of those underserved communities, but can provide a, a, a pathway leading to, uh, you know, to removal of, uh, of barriers for uh, migratory fish passage. And um, and like I said earlier, these are th uh, three-year awards, and so uh, uh, it depending on what the uh, the type of uh, project uh, it is and the phase it is in, uh, it may allow funding to occur solely in one year, it could be broken out in uh, incremental one, two, and three year awards. Uh, and so that's how it will vary. If if uh, a project is gonna need more time, typically we have a, I think it goes up to a five year no cost extension uh, to complete the project uh, or projects, I should say, uh, that you may be working on. Okay, next slide, please. So if you're not familiar with our team, our NOAA Restoration uh, Center team, each of us have different parts of the, uh, you know, the Atlantic coast. And, and so I've just listed uh, myself and colleagues that uh, can certainly help you out to, um, if you have questions regarding these NOFOs that are coming out. Uh, if, you, if you never saw the NOFOs from last year, we certainly can get you copies of them. Uh, and uh, the NOFOs that will be coming out this year will probably be similar to the ones we released last year. But again, we're trying to do some uh, improvements to those, and those are our work in progress right now. And uh, I'm optimistic that um, that you're going to see some um, uh, good uh, solicitations coming out shortly. But you have a list of folks there if you have a particular area that uh, you are working in and uh, you have any questions uh, or need, would like technical assistance or partnering with us, uh, if you haven't already, certainly reach out to um, one or more of us and we'll certainly try to um, you know, answer any questions and help you out. And uh, so that's about all I have. I just wanted people to be aware of uh, what's coming along uh, for funding. And, and I'm sure people know that there are other agencies out there, whether it's uh, culvert, uh, removal replacements through the Federal Highway Administration. They have a culvert program, of course, of substantial uh, bill funding, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They have um, uh, funding specifically towards fish passage as well. And uh, I, I'm probably not forgetting some of the other federal agencies that exist out there where other funding sources may occur as well. But 
uh, I think you're you're hearing at least about the key ones that um, we have today. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there, Jonathan. And and if uh, anybody's got any questions, I can certainly try to answer them now. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, we are running a little behind schedule. We can take one question if anybody wants to raise their hand. I don't see. Alan Weaver put in the comment box, he heard that the National Fish, Fish Passage NOFA would be in April. Any chance that is still happening, question mark? Yeah, the, the short answer, Alan, is it, um, what we heard, uh, I think, as of last week, it uh, was set back from April to probably May. So that's the late, latest we've heard. Of, um, and it's you know certainly beyond uh, regional staff's control. It's a lot of it relates to um, you know upper administration <laughs> within the Department of Commerce, and and so uh, I think the April has become May. At least that's what I recall hearing the latest. But we'll certainly hopefully uh, let people know as soon as it comes out uh, when it is going to be available or is available. Okay, great. And Jim. Um I'll, I'll confer with you after this and figure out what what uh, information we want to send out to folks in the recap from this uh, mm -hmm. this meeting, just to make sure that you know folks have a copy of, of all the information you shared here. Um, sure. You can, can figure out ways if we want to share slides or just links to Restoration Center website or whatever it may be. So, okay. Um, so thanks thanks for that update, and we'll switch over um, on a similar topic. Um, we've got Brian, uh, Brian Wade Jamandri from um, National Fish and Wildlife Federation um, to uh, okay. give a present. Go yeah, ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you can also pull up my slides, I only have like a couple of slides to show folks. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, hello, everyone. So I'm Brian. I work for NIFWIF. And for those of you who are not so familiar with NIFWIF, with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit based here in DC. Uh, we're the nation's largest private conservation grant maker. Um, we normally partner with folks on the ground, uh, consolidate public and private partners to help protect and restore our nation's fish and wildlife. Uh, while we focus on uh, wildlife conservation, fish and wildlife conservation, we also have worked uh, to build resilience of coastal communities throughout the US. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So uh, we do have a couple of uh, a few funding opportunities that targets are benefiting allozines or river herring and shad. Um, and as you can see on the map on the right side, uh, these are our focal areas. Uh, we do have two scales of funding. One is a nationwide scale and one is regional targeting these focal areas over on the right side. Um, our program uh, priorities to fund or support are mainly uh, to restore or enhance aquatic habitats or connectivity, which includes outreach, planning and design, uh, implementation, as well as monitoring and research if they are embedded within your uh, connectivity uh, restoration projects. And I encourage everyone to go to our website and check out our business plans. Uh, we, if you want more information about how we prioritize all of these uh, areas and some of our other uh, focal species. You can find it on our uh, business plans, which is basically a blueprint for our investments for the next uh, 10 years or so. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So these are the uh, current funding program RFPs that we have right now. So like what I mentioned earlier, we have two that are nationwide in scale. One is the America the Beautiful Challenge. It has about 160 million uh, fund available for this year, SCAL. Uh, the other one is a partnership with NOAA, uh, National Coastal Resilience Fund, which has 140 million uh, funds available. And both of those the deadlines are coming up pretty quickly. Uh, and for our regional programs, uh, we have three RF uh, funds that are out right now one is the chesapeake bay stewardship fund specifically for the chesapeake bay watershed uh, another one is the long island sound futures fund it has about 10 million available for this year um, for projects that are located in long island sound and connecticut river watersheds and the last is the northeast forest and rivers funds uh, which encompasses uh, the northeast region uh, watersheds uh, that rfp hasn't been out yet it 
will be out for next week. I so I've heard from our program folks. Um, and if you guys have any questions or specific information that you want to know, uh, check out our website at nipif.org, or you can just send me a message directly and I will forward you any informations and I will refer you to our program. And that's it. Thank you, Brian. Um, sure. Yeah, glad to hear, you know, there's so many um, great funding opportunities out there that could uh, could benefit River Herring. Um, I will um, include the your website along with your contact info and the um, recap from this meeting, if that's okay. Yep, no problem. And um, if there was any lingering questions for Brian, I didn't see anything in the questions chat or raised hands. Um, and we are running again a little behind, so we'll um, we'll go ahead and move on if, if that's all right. Um, but again, yeah, really appreciate it. Um, next up, we have um, Emily Farr and Mike Bowser. Um, they're they're going to talk about the River Herring Network, I believe it is. So Emily's got her hand raised. Uh, Emily, you should be able to unmute now. Great, I am unmuted. Um, I, am I able to share my screen? Uh, now you should be able to, yeah. Okay, so you're seeing this one. Yes, yes. Great. Uh, do you see my slides now? Yep, you do. Go ahead. Okay. Awesome. Let's see if I can turn my video on too. Great. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Emily Farr um, with Manomet, and let's see. You probably see my video too. There we go. Um, and I am here um, representing the Gulf of Maine River Herring Network, which I co-facilitate. Um, with Mike Talhauser, who is also on um, with Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. Um, and the, we've talked about this network um, on one of these forum meetings um, in the past, but our mission is to advance collaborative research and co-management of river herring in the Gulf of Maine by really providing a forum for regular communication, um, trust building, and identification of collaborative projects and opportunities. Um, how we're organized, we have a listserv of a little over 90 people, um, and we've been holding three meetings a year since we started in um, late 2020, mostly um, virtually given kind of the wide geographic range of folks in the network. Um, but um, we have had one um, in-person meeting earlier this or late last year. Um, and this map here on the right is a little bit outdated. I think it's from one of our first meetings in 2021, but it gives you an idea of kind of the geographic range of participants in the network. We're fairly focused on Maine, um, but we have quite a few participants from Massachusetts and other parts of the Northeast. Um, and so the network is really grounded in bringing together a lot of different perspectives um, to share information kind of on a level playing field. And we have a group of commercial fishermen, towns, community members, researchers, nonprofits, and managers at um, federal, state, local, and tribal agencies um, all focused on kind of combining our different values and capacities to um, move our kind of collaborative priorities forward. Um, and so a little bit about what we're focusing on in 2021. We had a our first sort of in-person hybrid meeting in December, really focused on um, collaborative monitoring. And we spent some time prioritizing some key questions that have come up over the past three years of network discussions um, and really kind of talked about how the capacity of this network of people can help address some of these really big questions. Um, so the kind of priorities that came up through that conversation were better understanding the drivers of migration and movement patterns, um, better understanding river herring production and how that relates to harvest management, um, understanding what happens in the estuary and the ocean, and then how can we quantify the effort and value of harvest and stewardship and really describe how that fits into the resiliency and sustainability of these runs? Um, these are obviously huge questions, but the strength of this 
network is really the ability to kind of monitor and compare across a range of different runs with different characteristics. So we're focusing this year on really expanding and uh, better coordinating and sharing data around some key parameters that help build towards some of these questions. And so looking a lot at temperature, um, juvenile emigration monitoring, both timing and length and weight, and then um, zooplankton in lakes and ponds as some of the key um, areas of focus for this year. And then I think the well, so we're hoping to have two interns this summer to help support both the field work and the data management. And then the real bigger question here that all of our work is focused on is how can we achieve real collaborative and practical research that answers both questions that communities have and um, management needs. Um, so one of the projects that we're working on that Jason alluded to earlier um, is we received some funding from the Mid-Atlantic Council to um, develop a coastwide river herring count data platform. And the goal of that is really to build on preliminary efforts that have been made to capture run counts um, and create a place for communication and kind of a way to get a better sense of the status of river herring runs coastwide every year, um, particularly in between assessments. Um, and so below on the slide is an example of a dashboard that we developed last year as a kind of pilot project just to track semi real time counts across a few different runs in Maine. Um, but we're planning to work um, on this coastwide platform with um, a faculty member and students at the College of the Atlantic um, to develop a platform using our shiny um, to allow counts to be uploaded and visualized. Um, so we're planning to have a lot of kind of iterative outreach um, starting this summer and doing kind of initial development of that and then piloting it around the spring run next year um, and building in lots of opportunities for sort of feedback and adjustment so that we can meet the needs that different users have. So I anticipate we'll reach out to a number of different people here um, as that gets underway. Um, and then one of the other big priorities for the network is documenting the role of local stewardship um, and better understanding the relationship between stewardship and sustainable river herring runs. Um, and then thinking about how management might more fully account for that stewardship role. Um, in Maine, where there's still river herring harvest, harvesters really play a critical role in run stewardship in addition to many, many other community members. Um, and harvest is, of course, a really important incentive for that stewardship. And so we're really interested in hearing kind of perspectives from other geographies about what stewardship looks like and how it relates to run health and how its role might be incorporated into thinking about how we manage these species. Um, so these are just some of the questions here that we're thinking about. Um, how does stewardship impact runs? What happens if we lose it? And what metrics are important for us to be thinking about? Um, and how, we, how might we learn from other places outside of Maine and the Gulf of Maine? So um, we'd really love to talk more about this question and um, please reach out um, if that's something that's of interest. Um, and I think that's pretty much all I have. Um, you can contact Mike or I, um, our emails are up there. Um, we reach out to one of us if you're interested in joining our listserv and then we have um, a website um, GOMRiverHerringNetwork.org that has some good resources and we're continually updating it. Um, so welcome thoughts on other resources that we should add as well. Um, and I think that's about it. Thanks. We have we have one hand up here um, from Kevin Job. Is that Kevin? Did you have a question for Emily? And Kevin, you should be able to. Uh, I think that I think that must be someone under my name because it's not me. My hand is down still. It looks like there's two of me. I'm not sure why. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. It's kind of been happening today. Um, Wilson Laney, you had a? Did you have a question? Yeah, quick question, uh, Emily. Thanks for the presentation. That was great. Is one of the things that you all might be looking at? Um, you know, reestablishing or initiating uh, the, the river herring festivals that used to occur up and down the East Coast in the past. That's one thing that we tried to do um, during uh, putting together the new strategic habitat conservation plan was to document a lot of those festivals. And it just occurs to me that that might be a good way to promote uh, stewardship. 
Yeah, that's a really good question and a really good idea um, to document all those festivals in one place. I don't know, Mike, or if anyone else here knows if that already exists, but if not, um, that's a great idea. Um, Emily, we took a, a crack at, you know, documenting as best we could um, in, in the forthcoming um, River Herring Habitat Conservation Plan, uh, you know, with with Wilson's uh, encouragement. Um, but I'm sure, you know, there, there may be more up there in New England that we just don't know about. So um, it's, it's a good point. And, and that social element of, of these runs, I think, is, is really worth, you know, promoting and highlighting. Yeah, agreed. And and Emily, if you guys, when you see the uh, the table we put together, uh, if you guys have feedback on it, we we sure love to hear it. Sounds great. Thanks for that um, update, Emily. And um, we'll be sure to if the um, Gulf of Maine River Herring Network org website isn't already on the um, our River Herring Forum webpage, um, we'll be sure to get it up there. And um, and I'll be you know include that link in the uh, meeting recap after this. But um, glad to see all the the good work that's going on up there. Um, really exciting. Um, with that, I think we'll move on to our last scheduled update, um, which was from USGS. Uh, they're still here. Should be Molluska. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I want to share my screen. Should be able to now. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yep. We see yeah, the presentation. That's great. Okay, hello. Um, my name is Milus Olivera Hai, and I work with David Cassia at the um, USGS Eastern Ecological Science Center at Litton Research Laboratory. And today I'm going to give an update uh, of our project that is um, genetic stock uh, identification of American shad and, Amer and river, river herring in bycatch. Um, so, in order to, de uh, to define a genetic, um, a genetic uh, baseline, uh, we collected some, or we we received some um, individuals or some samples uh, from along the coast. Um, in case of American shad, we received samples from 30 locations. We had we have about 2,280 pinklets. Um, and these are from different years. Um, in addition, we also had other wife samples. For this one, we had for 12 locations and we had about 578 fin clips. Um, we also have uh, blueback herring samples. This for nine, nine locations and we had about nine, 981 fin clips. Uh, so these uh, these samples are all in our tissue repository. Um, they are available upon request if someone needs them for research. Um, we also have some mixed stock samples. Some were obtained through collaboration with the Northeast Observer Program. Um, we also had some mixed stock samples from the Bay Fundy and Delaware Bay. Uh, for this, we had in total about 350 samples. And the important update that I had today is that we had selected a SNP panel, and right now we are using in, using this panel to sequence um, samples. Um, we had about 864 samples from 27 inland locations that we are sequencing, and in this sample, we also had include some mixed stock samples from Bay Fundy and Delaware Bay. Um, this work was possible uh, with close collaboration with Nina Overgaard, Ter Kilsen, and Ryan Frankoviat from Cornell. Um, so right now we are waiting for the sequencing 
results. I think they are going to start the sequencing tomorrow. Um, I would like to thank to all the people that have sent samples. This is a hard work that they have done to, to send these ones. Um, I would like to thank uh, also the people that have sent pictures, since most of our work is in the lab, we don't have the opportunity to take beautiful pictures like the one that we have here. And I would also like to thank the people that have given us lab and data analysis support. Um, this is the QR code um, that will take you to our web page where you can find more information about the project and you can download the protocols for tissue sampling. Um, also, if uh, you think that you have some mixed up samples that could be useful for us, please uh, reach out. Um, here are our contact information. And that's basically what I have. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, providing that update. I uh, will be sure to send um, your website out, um, you know, in our in our uh, meeting recap to, to folks who are interested. And um, but just to be clear, I mean, this is uh, this is basically a voluntary. You know, folks send samples to you. It's it's. Um, I, I guess I noticed maybe some places where we we could do better, get better coverage for you with with river specific stocks. So. Um, you know, encourage folks to, to take a look at, uh, you know, where, where they have samples and where maybe we can continue to, you know, strengthen this pipeline to, to get more uh, fin clips over to the lab here. Um, is, are there, yeah, I mean, are there places where you'd like to target more fin clips from Molesco or, um, you know? Uh, we are more, mostly interested in mixed stock samples um, okay. because they know, like, what we are trying to do with the sequencing, sequencing that we are doing right now is to define a baseline. I suppose if you had like some other interesting samples, we could use those too. Okay, so not river specific, I see. Um, okay. Well, great. We'll appreciate that um, update. And I don't, I didn't see any hands raised. Um, here for you, but obviously folks can follow up with uh, the USGS lab if they have questions. Um, I think you know that um, we. I'm glad we could cover that. I'm glad we could get you guys in here to give an update on the work you've you've been been doing, and um, yeah, look forward to seeing some of the results, uh, more more recent results that you guys are working on. Um, Anything else? Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you. And that takes us out of our, um, you know, scheduled updates. Uh, again, probably uh, later than uh, than we intended. But uh, apologies for that um, technical delay. Um, you know, we had intended to adjourn in about twenty five minutes. So, um, if you know now is sort of the open discussion period of the meeting, and um, if there were any you know lingering questions on any of the presentations we saw today, certainly welcome those now or um, updates from other other groups, uh, other efforts, um, interesting anecdotes. Um, you know, th as I said, this is you know our intention is to have it to be an open discussion as much as we can. So um, you know, folks, raise your hand or. Um, you know, I a question in the chat box. It looks like uh, Wilson Laney wanted to, to kick us off here with the open discussion. So go yeah, ahead, hey, Wilson. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I don't, I don't have any updates from, from down south here, but I did have a question. I know it uh, seems to me it was a year or so ago that the uh, ASMFC and the USGS Leetown Lab had put out a list of, I think, if memory serves correctly, it was maybe like 10 different projects related to um, uh, nadromous and or diadromous species. Uh, not all of them were allocene, but uh, is it possible for us to get an update on the status of those projects? That's something I would be interested in for sure. Maybe, maybe James could address that. 
I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't have anything offhand that I could be able to update on those on the on that list, but it's something I definitely could consider for maybe put together for the next forum, or even send out something short in between, because uh, that's still quite a few quite a ways away now. But maybe we can get into it in more depth at the next forum. Okay, thanks, James. That sounds good. I'll make a note of that, James, and so we can make sure we, we circle back on that at a future meeting. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, ben. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Jonathan. I just wanted to provide a, a couple of quick updates on the St. Croix that, that some of you may be aware of and some of you may not. Um, so kind of building on what uh, Jim Turek outlined earlier with the, um, the current funding that we have for projects at Woodland and Grand Falls dams, which are dams number two and three, respectively, from the ocean. Um, as many of you may be aware, Milltown is slated for removal this year. That's dam one. Um, so we're looking forward to improved passage there. So um, kind of highlights the importance of, of that Woodland site now, uh, as it's about to be dam number one following this year. Um, and then another, another good news story, sticking with the St. Croix, is um, in 2022, we had the highest level of adult returns since 1990 uh, with 712,878 individuals. So really good news there. And it's up over about 500,000 that we had in, in 2021. So about a 50% increase there. Um, so definitely, definitely some good things happening in the St. Croix and we look forward to continued progress there. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate that update from the, the far north of at least the U.S. coast range of River Herring. Um, some exciting movement up there. All right, looking for other hands here. Anybody else um, interesting developments in their local watersheds or with their um, groups? Kevin? All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll bite here, Jono. Um, I just kind of wanted to circle back again on, um, you know, coming off of Carrie's paper, but also, uh, um, you know, for from our stance here in at least Connecticut anyway, um, the numbers that we're faced with now, unfortunately, are just, you know, where we experienced some of the worst runs on record last year, which I know we covered that in October, so I won't, you know, go back down that road again. But, you know, one of the things that you know, we're looking at with especially um, these, you know, the catch caps and the, the fisheries offshore. It's just trying to look at them in a way that are a little bit easier to digest. Um, you know, when I first started looking at these, metric tonnage really didn't mean anything to me, um, especially, you know, these are small metric tonnages compared to at least what the, the targeted quota was for, say, Atlantic herring um, back, you know, 10 years or so ago. So we just, I, I went in and started looking at some of the, the literature that was there and looking at David Bethany's work uh, back in 2014, just to get a sense of what the land and river herring were size-wise. So we were able to get an idea of those fish being on average, at least in uh, our, our areas here, about 200 millimeters. And then we pulled Ken Sprankle's work on the Connecticut River to look at what the average weight would be for a fish of that size. It equals out to just about 100 grams. So each metric ton is about 10,000 fish. And the only reason I bring that up is if we were to look just at the um, Atlantic herring um, catch caps in just in area three and two, uh, that combines to 284.3 metric tons, which if these were to be all, you know, alewives of that size, based on the reed paper, 56% of those fish would come from the Long Island Sound, Block Island Sound area. And again, this is, you know, we're just assuming here, but that's 1.592 million fish. Um, if these are, you know, all alewives or bluebacks, um, this is assuming, you know, this isn't made up of the proportion of Atlanta or American, sh American shad, but the, uh, you know, the, the, the limited data that is out there suggests that American shad make up usually less than 9% of that um, actual cap landing. So, it's just when we're looking at a state last year where we passed 175,000 fish, that's combined both species across the entirety of the state. Um, and we're down from averaging about a half a million fish. When we're talking about the potential for 1.5 million landed fish, um, that for us is very significant. 
Um, so I just, you know, I kind of want to bring that back to the, the forefront here. We can remove all the dams we want, um, but if there's nothing waiting at those dams to go upstream, we have an issue. So thank you. Appreciate it. Kevin, that was um, that, let's see, 1.59 million fish estimate, obviously with the, you know, the associated um, assumptions there. Um, but that was from the combined the bycatch across several years. Is that right? No, sorry. That's so. There's the the catch caps, the allowable catch caps. Yeah. Um, so for herring, if you it's broken down by area. So if we just were to put area three, which is off of the Cape, and then Southern New England, or you know area two, which is it goes down through the Mid Atlantic, um, it's a large area. It's two hundred and eighty four point three metric tons, and that's across um, the the near shore bottom trawl and the midwater trawl fleets. And so we just I just wanted to look at something that was more than just all right. We've got two hundred and eighty four. 0.3 metric tons that's allowed in just the Atlantic carrying fishery. What, what does that equate to an individual fish? Because there's really no, there's nothing that really does that other than the Reed paper and some of the work in Bethany's paper. It was just hard for me to really grasp what we're looking at. And I just wanted to do that so we can look at our runs in Connecticut that we have, you know, some of these runs are over 20 years long um, and just get an idea of what potential is there based on the Reed paper. And that's, you know, that's where we came up with it. It's, you know, it's really, it's tough here in Connecticut because we have, um, you know, like I said, last year is about 175,000 fish statewide, but 88% of those fish came from just one lake. So from just Bride Lake, um, some of our stronger runs that averaged between 20 and 40,000 fish, we were down at double digits in some of those last year. We didn't even make a thousand fish. Um, so it's just, it's, it's tough. We're, really getting by with very few fish here. So I wanted to look at it in a way that would help me understand what potential is being taken out there and how could that actually affect um, what's coming back. That's not to say that all those fish captured at 200 millimeters are going to come back in a year or two, but the potential's there. And I just, I, I kind of want that on everybody's mind because worst case scenario here is it's, it's really bad. Right. No, I appreciate you, you know, giving some context to that. I think Ben Gahagan put a comment in that is um, 521 is mostly area 1B, not area 3. Did ben, did you want <laughs> to? Um, I, I don't quite follow that. I don't know if we're just given my lack of familiarity, but um, I don't know if you wanted to chime in with any additional context there. I appreciate, Kevin, you, you giving us some you know, some some numbers to think about in terms of, you know, equating that that metric tonnage to numbers of fish. Um, and, you know, just yeah, yeah, no problem. I think what, another way to wrap your mind around, um, you know, what what the issues are. Yeah, exactly. There you go, hey, Jonathan. Can you hear me now? Yeah, thanks. Great. Yeah, no, I was just pointing out that that catch, off, the catch that Kevin mentioned off of Cape Cod as being Area 3 was most likely actually in Area 1B. Um, that's Stat Area 521, but where the fleets tend to work is in the northern part of that, which is not Area 3. Um, and I just one point of interest for people looking at older estimates to newer estimates is as part of the baseline from micro SAS to SNPs it's worth calling out for alewipe is that Hudson River switched from southern New England to mid-Atlantic between those two pieces of research so if people decide to start digging into that it is worth noting that as well uh, when you start looking at bycatch association and where everything's going and I'd also point out that it's possible that Kevin's estimates of number of fish per metric ton could even be skewed low um, because especially the some of the fleets that work closer to shore than the midwater trawl fleets so some of the small mesh bottom trawl fleets can pick up smaller fish than 200 mill millimeters and it's also important to note that a lot of those small mesh fleets operate across multiple species not just within the uh, herring or mackerel fisheries so again, that's an un, perhaps an underrepresentation of what some of those fleets are catching. No, thanks for the context there, Ben. Um, yep. It's it's a lot to wrap your head around, but um, but appreciate um, both of your your comments here. 
um, you know, and, and, and for raising the concerns for sure. Um, let's see, anybody else or anything else we need to touch on on that particular issue? I, I can't raise my hand because I'm a presenter, but this is Jamie Cornan. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in this discussion, you should listen to our ground, uh, excuse me, our hearing plan development team meeting tomorrow. I think we will talk about some of these issues, um, both what we've learned from the paper, the recent papers, as well as what we're seeing at sea with river herring and shot bycatch. So that, again, our, our herring plan development team meets tomorrow afternoon, and you can find details about that on our website. I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. I also um, sent the organizers the map of the catch cap areas. I know people are like, where's that? What's that area? So, so the map is also in the, the chat. There. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jamie. I just shot that back out to the entire audience because I think you just sent it to the uh, presenters there. And then I, you know, I don't know that we'll get the meeting recap out. Um, before your meeting tomorrow. So, trying to see. Looks like you. I just sent you the notice as well. Yeah. Okay, great. I'll I'll just yeah I'll just put that right back in the chat for everybody, if that's all right. Thank you. Okay, great. And then yeah, we will. Uh, I I know there's several subsequent meetings there. So um, by the time we get our our uh, meeting recap out, we can get that um, information and that that email. Um, but for folks who are are looking to um, attend the meeting tomorrow. Um, ch check the chat here before you leave the meeting today to get that link um, with the notice. All right, we had uh, Bill Lucy. Yeah, just I was really uh, it was good to hear that there, there there's a potential for a, a coast wide portal to do some real run timing. I know we used to have that just in Connecticut. Um, <clears throat> but I, you know, now that we have this baseline data and USGS is looking to, you know, increase the robustness of that, it it, it seems to me that um, given the, the allocation between the, the different reference, genetic reference zones that were in the read paper, uh, I think we might have to start thinking about distinct population segment management. I don't know if that's already being done at some level or if that's a if that's a reality. I know it's a difficult situation. My background is salmon, where we had all kinds of weirds and things, and a lot of, a lot of information to do it that way. But um, you know, the situation in Connecticut is getting pretty dire. It's already dire for blueback, and so if we look at these things as you know distinct population segments. Um, I think we stand a better chance at solving the problem. So I just throw that out there, and I know we're going to talk about some of this stuff uh, maybe tomorrow at the meeting and some of these other ones coming up. But it's it seems to me like it's getting pretty critical. So just a just a way to think about it. Yeah, thanks, um, Bill. And you know, where I work in habitat, it's not really my the the manager fisheries manager side of things not really in my wheelhouse so I can't comment on it but I think um, Ben Gahagan's hand went up if he wanted to, to add any other uh, context there yeah Bill that that's a great point um, from the I can't speak to actual management actions down the road but for the stock we don't have a stock assessment subcommittee chair so I'm just volunteering this um, we are doing many of our analyses at the regional level that was shown in uh, the genetics papers that Carrie went over for, with the SNPs. Um, it'll be interesting to see what uh, Dave Kaziak and, and uh, his camp comes up with the GTC panel. Maybe that's, I didn't catch how many markers they were going to be using for that, but um, just with the fluid I'm sequencing, we did a 96 marker uh, because that kind of fit into the plate size. And if Eric or Carrie's on here and want to expand on that with more technical detail, they can. Um, but it kind of worked with what we had and provided us enough power to do the analyses we wanted to do. Um, but with GTC, it's definitely possible they could pick up a couple hundred markers and maybe have a little bit more power than we had 
uh, in our studies. So it's good to see the ball moving forward. Uh, but yeah, absolutely going down to at least these regional reporting group levels will be important as we understand what's going on and then uh, go from there to figure out if there's management actions that can or should be taken. Yeah, that's really encouraging. And I know the 96 Liza plates are kind of standard. And so I understand that. Um, and that's why I brought up the mitochondrial stuff in the past is because um, if you really want to get down to river, I, you know, I had a colleague that looked at the uh, uh, Yukon Kuskokwim because those rivers had crossed over through, you know, fairly recent geologic time multiple times. And so to do a mixed stock fishery analysis in Kuskokwim Bay, you know, where the, you're catching both rivers, um, they couldn't figure it out through SNPs. Um, but when you dug into the mitochondrial, which is, you know, more involved, obviously, and I, I understand, you know, the, the response before. But as we develop these, these genetics, um, they can become a really, um incredible tool to the point where you could be you know grabbing fins out on the boats when the bycatch comes in and you know getting some real-time genetics uh, management going on in the in the in the hopeful future yeah that, that would be phenomenal i think that um I'd, I'd encourage people to go to the council meeting tomorrow and um certainly you need to have the sampling programs available to get those samples, which I think currently in a lot of these fisheries that encounter river herring, that's just not the case and the funding isn't there to provide the, just kind of the samples to run a program like that, which would be great if it was, and maybe in the future it could be, but that's a, that's I think a currently a, a stumbling block to going to more of that Alaska, model like model of fisheries management and monitoring for bycatch of sensitive species or, or sensitive populations but i think as an end goal that's where a lot of people involved in these projects would like to see it go great thank you yeah good discussion and um i know there have been a number of um notices out there about um the industry funded monitoring program um, ceasing, uh, I think in the Atlantic herring fishery, if I recall, and I can um, put that um, that notice in the, uh, the meeting recap as well. I'll make a note to do that. Um, let's see, we still have, you know, Ben and, and Bill's hands up, but I think those are relics of, of the last, yep, they must be. Um, and, you know, we have five minutes left, obviously, you know, folks put questions in the chat or um, raise your hand. Any last thoughts for today's meeting? Updates, interesting things you've seen on the water. <laughs> um, I guess in just it will give another minute or two but um did want to know we had um pretty good attendance today there was a couple of duplicates in the attendance list um but i think we capped out over 100 people um we'll, we'll send the numbers out in, in that recap um but you know glad to see there's still sustained interest there um you know we're going to continue to try and bring you know relevant presentations to this meeting um you know recent papers if if you guys are you know at a conference or developing a presentation and you say gee that would be a great um topic to cover at the forum you know send it send it to me send it to james and we'll do our best to uh to get those folks to come in and present or um you know try and figure out who we who we can get to uh, come and speak on specific topics um you know we're trying to you know keep our, our finger on the pulse and in, in terms of uh what's going on out there with research and management and um you know just keeping an eye out for for uh, new papers if you have notices or um, papers that you would like to get sent out to the river herring forum distribution list you can contact us as well we can we can do that um you know we, we can kind of batch those things out throughout the year um as updates are are uh, available and, and relevant um so you know again this th that is the intention of this this uh, format is to you know, facilitate information sharing to, you know, to better, um, you know, manage, conserve, restore river herring uh, coastwide. So glad to have, you know, good representation up and down the coast and from a variety of, uh, you know, experts here today. It's, it's um, always great to, to see the sustained participation. Um, 
our next meeting is scheduled for October. I can get you the actual date potentially. It's on our webpage, um, which I always link in the emails. Um, our next meeting is October 30th, so maybe it'll be a Halloween themed um, meeting. Um, you know, if, again, if you have, if you're working on something and you want to bring it to a, a forum meeting, please, we'll send out the call for presentations, you know, about two months or a month and a half ahead of that meeting um, to, to the distribution list. You know, please uh, consider presenting, consider sharing your work. We're very fortunate to have, you know, all the good uh, technical expertise we had today. Um, yeah, I'd really appreciate Carrie calling in all the way from Hong Kong. Um, it, I think it was, you know, like 3 a.m. at local time for for her. So, um, you know, really appreciate, you know, folks, you know, going out of their way to share their work and hope we can, you know, continue that tradition as we, we move forward. So, um, you know, thank you all. James, did you have anything else you wanted to, to say to round out the meeting or? Um, no, I don't think so. I just really appreciate everybody that presented and everybody who attended. Uh, like you said, this has been really good. And I know we already have an, quite enough few number of people registered for the next one. And look forward to it. Yeah. And if, um, you know, if you have issues registering or accessing, you know, let us know. We can run tech support on that. Um, and if you are interested or want to get on the distribution list, the email list, um, you know, reach out to us, we can add you to that list. And um, similarly, if you wanna be removed from the list, uh, reach out to us and we can we can get you off that list to, to lighten the uh, load on your inbox a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, here to, you know, serve as that conduit and happy to do it. So, so thanks for everybody for your attention today. And um, yeah, with that, we can close out and we'll see you at the end of October. Thanks everybody, have a great day. Thank you.